One of the most interesting bits of casting for the upcoming era of Doctor Who was drag artist Jinx Monsoon, who is a winner of RuPaul's Drag Race, has recently just done a stint on Broadway playing Mama in Chicago. When you're good to Mama, Mama's good to you, if you know what I'm saying. Award-winning actress, singer, and two-time RuPaul's Drag Race winner Jinx Monsoon will appear in a major role in the new series of Doctor Who. Jinx has cultivated an international fan base after winning two seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race, including an all-star season where she was crowned, quote, Queen of Queens, competing against other winners of the show. Jinx joins Doctor Who after completing a sellout run on Broadway. Her run on Broadway was a historic moment for the LGBTQIA plus community as she became the first drag queen to play the role of Mama Morton, breaking box office records with her eight-week extended run. Rusty Davis, showrunner, says, In a galaxy of comets and supernovas, here comes the biggest star of all. Jinx Monsoon is on a collision course with the TARDIS and Doctor Who will never be the same again. Look at her. She looks absolutely fabulous. Awesome stuff. We've already seen some brief um, snippets of her in costume as this uh, the most powerful enemy the Doctor has ever faced, apparently. However, while this is a really cool get for Doctor Who to get a big Broadway star, drag queen icon involved in Doctor Who, you can imagine how YouTube reacted. If you just look up Doctor Who drag, you get Doctor Who's woke marketing signals, bad things to come, drag queen most powerful enemy yet, drag queens come for Doctor Who to change it forever, wokeness over talent as well, woke fail in there. Oh, you've got Rabbi as well in these very unflattering shorts, very fun. Uh, Mecha Random 42, uh, they hate you doctor who casts drag race uk winner doctor who goes full awoke etc doc uh, rusty davis will not save doctor who uh, etc so basically uh people weren't very happy with this decision however i didn't want to react to these clips or anything because it seems like it's uh these ones aren't really getting much traction mecha random 42 has got twice the amount of subscribers that i've got but only 800 people watched this video you know golden age geek um got over a thousand views for this one 500 for hollywood scholar it seems like in terms of doctor who youtube this reactionary outrage this faux outrage against jinx monsoon hasn't really catched any momentum hasn't really got anything however what well, i did see here kevin o'sullivan why is the bbc obsessed with drag after doctor who jinx monsoon announcement has ten thousand views so we have talked about kevin o'sullivan in the past he's a conservative pundit for the murdoch owned talk tv ofcom got involved because they broke hate speech rules by saying that having a same-sex couple in a doctor who story was quote predatory to children trying to perpetuate the groomer narrative basically by saying having a same-sex uh, couple on tv is akin to being a predator to children ofcom got involved a utterly vile debate on appropriateness of doctor who's same-sex storyline sparks ofcom complaint obviously even though they quite blatantly did break uh, hate speech rules for ofcom nothing's going to be done because guess who owns ofcom folks dun 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 michael grade is the chair of Ofcom, and he was chosen by Boris Johnson's conservative government. So he likely probably agrees with what talk radio, talk TV said. So nothing's going to be really coming from that. But I thought, tell you what, let's see what Kevin O'Sullivan, number one drag queen fan, ardent ally of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, what does he have to say about the BBC being, quote, obsessed with drag? Let's take a look at what uh, our old man Kevin has to say. Well, you'll be very excited to know that uh, Doctor Who uh, has a new companion, uh, and uh, that is a, a drag queen. It's someone called Jinx Monsoon. We are 10 seconds in. The first sentence is wrong. Uh, Jinx Monsoon is not playing the companion. The companion is played by Millie Gibson. Jinx Monsoon is just guest starring in seemingly at least one episode of the show. So we are one sentence in and we are already just completely off the mark. Okay, let's go. Who I'm told ra won RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh that's a television program. I do it. There's Jinx. Uh, so Jinx is going to be the big star on the next series of Doctor Who. That's okay. Fine. You know, uh, same as when you tune into EastEnders. Uh, there's drag queens all over Albert Square these days. Uh, as you say, you've got, uh, as I said, you've got RuPaul's Drag Race. I mean, you can't... Are drag queens all over Albert Square? I don't think they are. One second. I'm going to look this up real quick. So EastEnders Drag Queen. Actor Tara Misu is 
playing the first drag queen in EastEnders. This was uh, last year. Matthew Morrison, who is the drag queen Tara Misu, played a character in EastEnders. And this is them. They are a drag queen in the story, but 99 times out of 100, when you see them on screen, they look completely ordinary. Like, not that there would be anything wrong with there being a drag queen in Albert Square anyway, but this feels like this is just making something out of absolutely nothing. Okay. Okay, then. Let's see where it, let's see where he goes with this. I don't really move on the state broadcaster anymore for drag queens. I have nothing against drag queens. They can be in all these shows, uh, by all means. But why? Why? Uh, let's talk to The Sun's amazing TV critic, Ali Ross. Hello, Ali. Good evening, Kevin. How lovely to see you on this Tuesday evening. Okay, so this is fun. Talk TV is owned by Rupert Murdoch. The Sun is also owned by Rupert Murdoch. So this is quite literally... A Murdoch circle jerk. Okay. It's a pleasure, mate. Uh, now, uh, why is the BBC so obsessed with drag queens? I'm sure you're celebrating the appointment of uh, Jinx Monsoon to play a major role in the next series of uh, Doctor Who, but you're probably not that surprised, are you? Okay, so for, we need to kind of reject the premise of the question. So first things first, we know that Kevin O'Sullivan actually does have an issue with LGBTQ plus representation and gender non-conforming people being on TV. Literally, the last time we talked about this in Doctor Who, he got investigated by Ofcom for hate speech because his guest said that having a same-sex couple on screen was akin to being predatory towards children. Because Kevin did not have a rebuttal or a counter-argument to that, because he probably agrees with it, they got investigated by Ofcom. So we know that that part of the discussion is completely insincere. Kevin does not want gender non-conformity on the BBC. But it's a malformed question. Why is the BBC obsessed with drag? You've not done anything to sort of justify the premise of that question. You mentioned one actor, Jinx Monsoon, being in Doctor Who. You mentioned EastEnders, which, as we've established, has one drag queen who it's just a part of their character that's but basically just a little bit of a detail from what i just quickly googled there it looks like the character in eastenders they're more in civilian outfit more often than not and the storylines have to do with their relationship with their dad and their family not so much to do with their drag persona and also rupaul's drag race which is a popular show which has many branching shows on like the bbc but also across the world in their tv but why is the BBC obsessed with drag? Because of one drag actor in Doctor Who, one drag actor in EastEnders, and one show on BBC Three. This does not read to me as an obsession. If you were to throw a dartboard at the BBC television schedule, which, keep in mind, there's, what, nine channels on the BBC? Six or seven of them are doing 24-7 coverage. If you were to throw a dart at all of those TV listings and their scheduling for this 24-7 content, you would land more often than not on TV PC procedurals, you know, crime shows, crime dramas, things like Line of Duty, Happy Valley, Blue Lights, etc. You know, throw a stone in this universe and it's going to land on somebody who's worked on a BBC crime drama. But they're saying that they're obsessed with drag because of two actors in two different shows and one new show on the BBC. It's a malformed question. Kevin has not even met the baseline barometer for this conversation for this question for this discussion and because the bbc is a public service broadcaster i think it's good for the bbc to tell different stories from different demographics of different professions like i think that there's maybe more people who work in the police service or have had interactions with the police than there are people who work in drag or work as a drag performer but i think that, that proportionality works out in this case because they have two actors in two different shows and a talent show that has offshoots across the world. Like I said, it's an inauthentic question. You're probably not that surprised, are you? Kevin, you have no idea how thrilled I am <laughs> this rare opportunity to see a drag queen on the BBC. <laughs> 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 yeah, you... would we... I, I don't get the Jared Leto joker laugh that he's doing for this. Like, he's not even established the premise of the question. EastEnders... Doctor Who, RuPaul's Drag Race, and you're like, oh, we're, we're laughing because he's so obsessed with uh, with drag shows on the BBC. Like, we saw how he opened this this show here. Like, look at him, like, look at him here. And this is why I think Kevin O'Sullivan is such a bad 
pundit for conservative values. Canyon, uh, and uh, that is a, a drag queen. It's someone called... Like, he's got his notes. He's trying to figure out what he's got to say. He's basically, someone from up high has said, right, we need to push the drag queen groomer narrative. Here's your paperwork. Here's your time slot. Go. And Kevin just couldn't really give a shit. It's Monsoon, who I'm told won... RuPaul's Drag Race. Like, when it comes to, like, conservative pundits, like, say, Tucker Carlson, or who's that guy from GB News, or was it uh, was it also Talk TV, but the guy who says that you can grow concrete, that guy, I, he actually kind of acts like he believes the things that he says. Tucker Carlson, even though he doesn't, because we've got those Fox News texts and stuff like that, um, revealing that he also knows full well that he's lying to his audience. Like, they at least act like they believe the things that they believe. I don't think Kevin O'Sullivan's able to get that across. He goes, comes across as so insincere here that whatever the amount that talk tv is paying him they're paying him way too much he's just not a very convincing avatar for these values yeah, what you, would we do without the <laughs> yeah what yeah, is it what is it with them why are they so obsessed with drag queens uh it's a couple of reasons you've named three examples on a broadcaster that has numerous channels that broadcast 24 7. one is the relative success of rupaul's drag race and its appeal to a younger audience and they're desperate desperate to appeal to young people rather than the people who actually pay the license fee for them <laughs> weird um young people can also pay the license fee like, when I was a university student, I paid the license fee. When I was living in halls and student accommodation, I paid the license fee. Young people are allowed stuff for the BBC. Like, just because you don't like it when you're older, you boomer, doesn't mean that everyone else has to be miserable. Like, if you don't want to watch drag stuff, don't watch drag stuff. Like, it's, it's the stupid argument saying that I don't like this thing on the BBC, therefore they shouldn't fund it. There's BBC radio, there's BBC music, there's BBC films, there's BBC TV, of course, and news and stuff. And there's so much stuff happening 24 7 it is literally impossible to watch or listen to or consume all of it by its nature you can't consume all of it so as an like just by a mathematical probability there's some stuff there that you're not going to be able to watch so don't watch the drag stuff don't make your bigotry everybody else's problem is basically what i'm saying <laughs> two the drag queens have taken on a, a weird sort of political edge to them which of which the BBC would approve. Yes, drag queens have only just taken on a political edge. Not gender non-conformity and LGBTQ plus topics have never had any sort of political bent to them. Obviously, no, couldn't, couldn't possibly. Yeah. Um, I, I know it's jinx there. Um, it's a bloke in a dress, by the way. Yes. Um, insists that we refer to him as she, they. Yeah. And so the she's a bloke. She's a bloke in a dress then. Yeah, the, th the thing about drag queens is, and you say you've got nothing against them. I, I do. I, I just... <laughs> I, I've got a lot. <laughs> what don't you like about drag queens, Ali? Well, it's, 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 it's a celebration of women. It's not... Like, obviously, these guys are just conservative pundits. So they've only just understood the concept that the sun does not revolve around the earth it's in fact the other way around so i can understand why non-binary identity or gender non-conformity like jinx monsoon going by she they i understand why that's a little bit above their their thought processes it's mocking women yeah and uh, unless unless you do it like dame edna it's the only drag queen i think i've ever found funny you make it very obvious look i'm a bloke I'm not taking on any female yeah. identity yeah. here. It's just a device for comedy. I, I say that, actually, Some Like It Hot is the only other time I've found men dressing up as women funny. Yeah. In yeah. fact, probably the greatest film ever made. Um, but... For the, it's mocking women, says the two men complain about drag queens were false. Yeah, that's true. It, it's interesting how they try to claim to be supposed defenders of women, and it's just these two blokes trying to speak on behalf or speak over the women in the conversation. Firstly, the idea that drag queens are mocking women, that's an argument I've only ever heard spouted by homophobic people. I've never heard any sort of uh, good meaning criticism that has been phrased in that way from somebody who wasn't outright bigoted. But also, uh, for obviously drag queens different performers will get into things for different reasons they'll get into their their performances for different reasons that they'll want, they'll want to say different things but dra drag queens are kind of like trying to be a celebration of women and femininity and all these assets but also like if, if like the idea that there's only one way to express femininity that you know these big 
um, costumes, the hair, the makeup and everything and the proportions and stuff, that that is mocking femininity. In that way, that's uh, it, I actually think that argument is a bit more misogynistic than the actual drag artistry itself. It, I don't even believe that is, but the premise of the argument is more misogynistic than the drag performances themselves because it, pigeonhole, it pigeonholes femininity to just those superficial elements. Like, it's, it's, it's basically saying that femininity is the makeup, it is the clothes, it is what you wear, whereas that is absolutely not the case. Like, femininity can be many other things, and also women don't have to necessarily conform to that. And drag artistry also does not confine itself to those things either. There's a big, broad spectrum of drag performances that are taking place in, like, in all different fields and all different industries with it. So, if anything, this framing is kind of low-key misogynistic and it's also interesting that Ali Ross who works for The Sun is trying to defend women's virtue and say that drag artistry is actually offensive to women when we actually went over an article before written for The Sun by Jeremy Clarkson saying that women should not be working in TV full stop so why is Ali Ross claiming to defend women when he works for an outwardly misogynistic outlet owned by Rupert Murdoch who owns Fox News who have had massive misogynistic allegations made against them who have made a very hostile working environment for the women who work at Fox News. If you wanted to be misogynistic against women, if you wanted to degrade women, you wouldn't become a drag artist. You'd just work for talk TV. Yeah, and so they have this political baggage now, so the BBC thinks, oh, well, that's a good thing. We can use them to lecture people about <laughs> of course. how it's, well, with a, a, it with it's okay to wear a dress. They will never give any sort of examples of the BBC lecturing people with these examples from RuPaul's Drag Race or Doctor Who or EastEnders. Doctor Who, obviously, because Jinx Monsoon's episodes have not broadcast yet, but I doubt they've even seen the EastEnders episodes with a, with a drag queen. They probably don't watch RuPaul's Drag Race, which, honestly, the only political aspect of RuPaul's Drag Race is when they do Snatch Game and they dress up as politicians. That's, honestly, the most overtly political RuPaul's Drag Race gets. So this is not going to be substantiated at all. It's very progressive, Ali. It's very progressive. Yeah. So also the in, the disingenuous framing of saying that the BBC is some sort of bastion of LGBT plus progressivism, when the controller of the BBC said the other year that. Um, employees of the BBC could not go and attend pride parades and then backtracked on it claiming that they never said that even though emails were sent out to BBC employees saying do not attend pride parades. I had a BBC email at the time all of that went down. I work freelance and at the time I was working on a BBC production and I had a BBC email. I got the email from the control of the BBC saying you cannot attend pride parades and then he claimed and then he did public statements saying no we never sent that. They don't care. The material reality of the BBC situation as a political institution does not matter they're just going to try and frame the bbc as this wokey lefty institution even though the higher ups are literally put there by conservatives but it's not very progressive you're right it's a, a lot of women uh, you know I, i'm saying i've got nothing against drag queens but you brought up a good point a lot of women do have things against drag queens and they feel that drag queens mock women that they mock mm. femininity and there's certainly something sort of grotesquely there is on, there is a bit of caricature there is a little bit of satire when it comes to drag of course but that's not something that's exclusive to drag nor is it exclusive to something for women like for one second i'm going to become a conservative pundit for a moment and i'm going to talk about how on talk tv hosted by kevin o'sullivan why jorgen von strangle from the fair from the fairly odd parents cartoon is actually super offensive to men because it's a hyper stylized caricature of what masculinity is and i'm going to make a seven minute segment on talk tv talking about how the bbc are obs <laughs> how nickelodeon are obsessed with all of this now obviously satire and caricature can go any direction and even then drag queens as we've said before are more of a celebration of femininity and are a celebration of these things and also are just a form of satire how they're able to um express the femininity in a way that society would deem uh, cis women otherwise would not be would not be able to. They crowbarred in everywhere from Bake Off to Master. That's Mind. right. That's right. Go, just go away. Uh can you imagine this framing for anything else? Like Bake Off and Mastermind, they have a massive talent pool where they where they get people from all sorts of professions, all sorts of walks of life. Like, can you imagine any other framing of this? And it would be deemed acceptable. Like, for example, if I know that Big Nasty 
is like a big uh, is a big personality and he did um he did um he did bake off as well can you imagine the idea of oh black comedians why is the bbc so obsessed with black comedians there was you know they cast one in doctor who there's one in eastenders they did one in mastermind it's it's uh, they're so obsessed like there was no other framing of this that would be considered acceptable except when it comes to lgbtq plus topics like mastermind has episodes that broadcast multiple times a week mastermind has like daily episodes so they have to get a lot of people in sometimes they're going to be theater students sometimes they're going to be drag artists sometimes they're going to be rappers and musicians or botanists or whatever like here's the thing any amount of drag artists for these people is too many any amount of drag artists is too many any amount of gay people one is too much for these people they like kevin only had three examples at the top of the show and that's that prompted this entire discussion. A discussion, you're looking at me, doesn't even seem that particularly engaged with it. Like, it just seems like, okay, I've been given these notes from on high. Rupert Murdoch wants to try and create a drag panic like there is in America right now. So let's try and make this work in the UK. Whatever, I've got my notes. Let's just get Ali Ross from The Sun to do these talking. It's, it's just not... Uh, it's just not convincing. They're not even making the good case for it. So this is why, like I said, Kevin O'Sullivan is such a bad conservative pundit. Uh, let's quickly move on, uh, Ali. I wanted to get your take on uh, ungreat expectations. The B He cares so little about this topic. The BBC are obsessed with drag. He barely even got four minutes out of it. Four minutes and four seconds, and they're already on to something else. Like, the BBC is obsessed with drag. Here's three examples. Ali's going to bring up Mastermind and Bake Off. Bake Off isn't even owned by the BBC right now. So, four minutes. This, <laughs> like, okay. You get two schools of thought here, basically. There are two types of conservative pundits, okay? One where they say, let's just kill all the gay peoples, lead them to the gas chambers or whatever, and they don't actually believe it or care about it, okay? And you also get the ones who say, kill gay people, lead them to the gas chambers, but they do actually want them dead. Pop quiz, out of those two people, what's the difference? Trick question. There is, pra in practical terms, there is no difference. Kevin O'Sullivan, he wants to start an LGBTQ plus panic with this talk TV segment. I don't really think he cares. I don't really think he even knows what he's talking about. Hence why he can only get four minutes out of this segment. But with the people watching, they're the ones who are going to be riled up by this. They're the ones who are going to be radicalized by his rhetoric. He knows full well what he's doing. Whether or not he actually believes it, he thinks that, or he wants to communicate that he thinks that any amount of LGBTQ plus people in media is an obsession. One is too many. One is an obsession from the wokey left BBC. I don't think Kevin believes it, but in a practical sense, there really is no difference, providing that he's given enough money, providing that he's given the paycheck from talk TV, he's willing to say basically anything. It's like that line in Ghostbusters, if there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. And I think that Kevin, if there was to be some sort of, uh, you know, final solution to the drag problem, Kevin, even if he wouldn't believe it, he'd still be on talk TV saying, yeah, it's, it's a good thing that this is happening. He wouldn't be, he might not necessarily believe it, but he'd be willing to say it for the right price. BBC's take on Charles Dickens' classic novel, yeah. uh, which has basically been turned into a sort of bondage, spanking, sex spectacular featuring Miss Havisham addicted to... <laughs> oh, threaten me with a good time, Kevin. <laughs> ...opium. I, I don't remember that in the book. Uh, yeah. What is going on? <laughs> Well, the weird thing about this is... For, for okay, so I've not seen the recent BBC adaptation of Great Expectations. I know that Olivia Coleman plays Miss Havisham. I know there's a scene where Matt Perry gets pegged. And folks at home, if you want to know what pegging is, ask your dad. But basically, <laughs> there's a bit of debauchery in the recent BBC adaptation of Great Expectations. And that caused it to get a few headlines. And that sounds quite interesting. You know, it's an adaptation. It's a story that is approaching, what, like 150 years old? now great expectations written by charles dickens in the mid 19th century so you know there are multiple other adaptations of it i think helena bonham carter played miss havisham in an adaptation like 10 years ago so you know if they want to do something more interesting with it be our guest but let's see what the issue is here 
for one episode, it kind of held it together. And you thought, like, this is recognisably Dickens, Magwitch, isn't yeah. it? It was a bit weird when he tries to commit suicide in the first scene. But then for the second episode, you get Toast of London having his ass spanked in the first scene. And you think, oh, hang on, where's this suddenly going? Yeah. And <laughs> the, 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 the whole thing just collapsed within the space of an episode. It wasn't, as you say, it wasn't just the spanking. It was the opium. It was uh, it was the reintroduction. Because, like, yeah, isn't Miss Havisham in this version meant to be, like, addicted to opium? And that's, like, one reason that she's degenerating. So, I, I, like I said, I've not really watched the new version of Great Expectation. I've only seen a few clips and I've seen the trailer for it. But, like, what what's wrong with changing the adaptations somewhat? It's a story that has been adapted from, you know, big Hollywood versions to something like a South Park episode in, a, like in one of their earlier seasons. They had a character called Pip who got his own episode, which was this weird Great Expectations parody. So, you, you know, what's, what's the... I, Here's the th like I said, from the premise of BBC being obsessed with drag to now Ali Ross explaining what's wrong with Great Expectations, they're not doing any sort of like baseline justification for the arguments that they're making. Like they're just saying, oh, there's opium in it, and there's there's a Matthew, uh, there's um there's Matt Berry getting pegged, and there's like, and you need to explain why this is wrong, why this is a bad adaptation. They're not doing the sort of baseline thing. It's so effortless. Like the conservative grift is so easy. They just have to just spout nonsense, not apply no thought, zero brain, empty head, and they get a Rupert Murdoch nice little paycheck, and they get a a, a TV segment on it. This was this was like broadcast TV. I'm watching this on YouTube, but this was broadcast on TV of slavery in 33 minutes now this is set in That's 1839 right. yeah and it's slavery. all about the evil empire as well isn't it the, yeah, the evils slavery. of colonialism britain uniquely outlawed slavery and has spent the by this point 30 years policing the rest of the world so slavery doesn't exist trying to cut out the slave trade but of course in the bbc's heads mm. is it we're just okay so firstly that's just historically stupid okay i wasn't prepared for a historical diatribe uh, in a segment about the bbc being obsessed with drag so i apologize if i'm a little bit underprepared here but just because slavery was outlawed doesn't mean that slavery just outright stopped for example burglary is illegal burglary still happens and even when slavery was supposed to be stopped in america a lot of people wanted to carry it on they fought a war over it so, you know, just because slavery was outlawed in, what was it, it was like the 1820s or the 1830s in England. This was like a few years before Charles Dickens was even born, I believe. I, I don't have the exact dates to hand. Doesn't mean that slavery just stopped. There were powerful institutions who wanted to uphold these things because it made them a lot of money a lot of their industries a lot of their profits and everything was built on the back of slavery and even though it was outlawed they wanted to try and maintain it i don't know how this is applied in great expectations i've not watched it but to say that just because slavery was outlawed over the span of the setting of great expectations the bbc adaptation from 2023 doesn't mean that it outright stopped an evil empire we cannot be given credit yeah, yeah. for doing this amazing yeah. thing which if any other country say norway had been the first place in the world to outlaw the slave trade we would never stop eulogizing them on the bbc this was this is such a tangent like i said we started with the bbc being obsessed with drag and now we're trying to do some weird holier than thou britain's the best country in the world because we were one of the first to outlaw slavery or whatever even though the institutions were still built on the back of slaves and there wasn't really much in the way of reparations and indigenous people and people of different colors were still treated horrifically poorly for decades and centuries to come dickens was born in 1812 so slavery was outlawed a couple of years before that i believe i can't remember exactly but like like i, said, I wasn't expecting a discussion on slavery and uh and uh, colonial empire from charles dickens and great expectations when i got into a kevin o'sullivan bbc like there's so little fuel to the drag hysteria that kevin o'sullivan wanted to get his, get his audience on the hype train for that we've now massively pivoted it would be funny if it wasn't for the fact that these people want you dead but because it's us no credit at all is given uh, hundreds of members of the royal navy died trying to end the slave trade but 
Exactly. Just, let's, uh, let's... You can't use that argument. Confederates would say hundreds and thousands of people in America, Confederate soldiers died to try and uphold states' rights they deserve. Just because a lot of people died for a cause doesn't mean the cause was in and of itself inherently good. And also just, <laughs> I, this is such a weird line of thinking. This is so strange. Uh, we've just got a few seconds left. Let's uh, quickly remind ourselves of this uh, garish new version of Great Expectations on the BBC. Take it away. So we've got a few seconds left. So let's play a clip to fill up the time. Even though I've got a guest on who probably wants to say stuff. I can't play this because it'll, it'll get copyright claimed. But we've only got a few seconds left. Let's play a clip and fill out some. They have so little actual material to work with that they have to fill it out with Great Expectations footage. They care so little about these actual topics. Uh, yeah, that was Olivia Coleman as Miss Havisham there. Uh, the, thing yeah. is, the thing is, Ali, that although Charles Dickens didn't rail against colonialism and the British Empire in his classic uh, masterpiece novels, the BBC actually knows that he meant to. That yeah, was an omission on his part, and they've, they've repaired that uh, mistake on his part. Okay, well, this is dumb, right? Oh, God, I don't even know really where to begin. Just because slavery was outlawed before Charles Dickens was born does not mean that the remnants of slavery and its lasting impacts on uh, European culture and British culture were not still felt and expressed in his work. Uh, for, like, wasn't it, ugh, it's like I said, I was not expecting a Charles Dickens thesis here. Uh, so I apologize if I'm a little bit slow in the uptake, but like, what didn't Charles Dickens actually like write a, uh, a, a piece one second. Let me just, didn't he like write something that was, um, about the East India trading company. He wrote a letter like chastising them, uh, for the Indian Rebellion, Charles Dickens' uh, race and colonialism. I uh, even if, for example, the work like even f like this is like basic media analysis stuff. So just because the broader culture or something is not explicitly made apparent in a piece of text, does not mean that that socio-economic conditions do not inform the text itself. For example, Charles Dickens grew up during the Industrial Revolution. Now, I'm sure the words Industrial Revolution do not turn up in a lot of his classic works, but it is still informed by those works. Like Charles Dickens about the wealth gap and disparity, workshops and stuff in Oliver Twist, for example, uh, anti-Semitism in Oliver Twist with Fagin. You can see this illustration here in this open learn thing. Uh, one second. So while the empire is not very visible in Dickens' major fictions, it is still worth paying attention to his published statements on ethnicity and colonial rule engaging dickens's view on race and empire many critics point to his notorious article of 1853 the nobles yeah in response to the indian mutiny the indian rebellion in 1858 1857 he basically wrote a public letter condemning both the east india trading company and the indians who rebelled as well it's considered to be one of the most influential pieces of writing of the 19th century because the bbc would later use that in order to for their uh, for their impartiality policy <laughs> impartiality policy i kid but every joke has got a basis in reality you complain about the east india trading company and the indians who are rebelling <laughs> There we go, that's BBC impartiality. But I'm certain he wrote something about that at the time. Basically, he took a very, quote, nuanced approach to the topic, condemning both sides of it. But yeah, that, he, that was something he did. Dickens wrote an article condemning slavery in the... So yeah, even though Charles Dickens did, might not have explicitly written about these things in the text itself, doesn't mean that his work wasn't informed by these things. And also, like we said, it's an adaptation. It's able to use these things through the benefit of hindsight to give it a much more broader context context and also as a, as a different way to inform the work this happens with shakespeare as well particularly future adaptations of shows like um like merchant of venice as well which many people consider to be a, a pretty big like anti-semitic piece of work but it has also been like reappropriated recontextualized in order to have like be be shown through the lens of like a jewish perspective in italy during the uh 17th uh, 16th 17th century i'm sorry if i'm stammering if i'm sort of losing my train of thought here like i said i wasn't expecting this rabbit hole here but it just kind of shows just how loose the and tangential the conversation is between kevin and, and and ali here like they're just sort of like throwing out all the talking points they want we got pro uk sentiment because we ended slavery first even though it's not nearly that cut and dry um we're talking about the B 
BBC trying to reappropriate Great Expectations, even though it is one of what must at this point now be hundreds of adaptations of Charles Dickens' work. So it's able to recontextualize it, it's able to readapt it and reappropriate it for a modern audience. Death of the author, all, all these basic like media fundamental tenets of storytelling is this stuff is pretty basic but these guys have only just realized that's like blood circulates through the body so it's a little bit lost on them i understand that but it, it's so strange that these are the hills that they're willing to die on even though they don't really know anything about it or they're at least pretending to not know anything about it but yeah this is what the writer says i'm, I'm just trying to imagine what what Charles Dickens would have thought. Yeah, shut up, you're from Peaky Blinders. You're and not you're on the think... same planet as Charles Dickens, mate. And <laughs> by weird coincidence, it's exactly the same as the BBC thinks on everything. <laughs> so you get the line. <laughs> and you can airdrop this stuff in if you... He's not going to give any specific examples. Like, but it jars hideously to the point it doesn't make sense. And you can see the actors struggling with it as well. Yeah. It's just, what the hell is going on here? Uh, well, uh, C Camilla Long in the Sunday Times uh, said that uh, she basically saw the death of period drama in this and that uh, the thing about the BBC, it used to be the master of mm. period drama. Uh, it still likes to make period dramas. It just can't do them anymore. Well, it just can't help itself, can it? <laughs> yeah. Like, like I said, they're not even attempting to sort of make the case for this. Why can't Great Expectations apply these reappropriations? Why can't Great Expectations uh, recontextualize the stories and the era of uh, that Charles Dickens was alive in in order to play it to a different audience? Like, this is not like the B. How many? One second. Great Expectations adaptations. So the BBC have done an adaptation in 1959, 1967. 1981, 2011, and 2023. So this is at least the fifth adaptation that the BBC have done of Great Expectations. They can do something a little bit different. And that doesn't even include, for example, the 2012 film of Great Expectations with Jeremy Irvine, Robbie Coltrane, Ray Fiennes, Holiday Granger, Helena Bonham Carter, which was partially made by BBC Films. So this number of five for TV, the BBC have done so many adaptations of Great Expectations. So the idea that they might want to do something a little bit different with it is absolutely fine. If Charles Dickens was alive, he'd definitely have subtitles. titles. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's... It's almost kind of hard to articulate the responses to these talking points because they are so abominably stupid and it just lacks any sort of common sense. And like I said, they know full well what they're doing here. Uh, I don't know about Ali Ross, but Kevin definitely could not give any less of a shit about drag at the BBC or Great Expectations or upholding the legacy of Charles Dickens or making sure that his work is not besmirched by the woke beam. I honestly don't think that Kevin O'Sullivan gives a shit about anything other than what's going to get his paycheck at the end of the week. Let's look at the, let's look at the comment section. Doctor Who used to be this wonderful show about a guy traveling around having adventures and making people better now we've got a bloke in a dress unless Dame Medna or Hinge and Bracket turn up I'm done past like the idea that the Doctor that Doctor Who can still be a wonderful show about a guy traveling around having adventures making people better and also have a quote bloke in a dress like you can still do these things at the same time. You've had people wearing gender non-conforming outfits in Doctor Who's past before. It was um, it was uh, Martin Clune in, was it Kinder or was it Snake Dance, wearing, what well, I'm not going to say he was in drag or anything, but he was in slightly effeminate clothing, effeminate outfits, you know, a bit of makeup, a little bit of, you know, razzle-dazzle, things like that. So this isn't even, like, brand new for the BBC. The Oxbridge educated managers at the BBC are desperate to, quote, get down with the kids and virtue signaling diversity of shades. The rap black voiceovers or chirpy North and Irish accents between programs does my head. Oh, so I like how this guy is just up front. I hate black voices. I hate Irish Northern accents. I just want my received pronunciation accents. Go back to the BBC of the 50s and 60s where they wouldn't let anybody outside of London do anything for the BBC. Um, four words to some of the BBC, Jimmy Savile and Rough House. These guys are conservative, keeping mind they do not give a family friendly fuck about uh, protecting victims of child sexual abuse boris johnson once said that he did not want to give funding to research uh, historical cases of child sexual abuse because it would quote be spaffing money up the wall and considering the context the use of the word spaffing is entirely inappropriate i wonder what bill hartnell would have made of this bill hartnell uh, was not happy with black people being in Doctor Who. He is absolutely the wrong person to ask. 
John Pertry as the cleaning lady is like, oh, of course, yes, Doctor Who can never be a wonderful show about a guy traveling around having adventures to make people better, even though in The Green Death he dressed up as a woman as the cleaning lady. Nope. It turns out Doctor Who actually died in 1973. Or was it 1974? Go woke, go broke. Um, you know, Jinx Monsoon has just taken part in a sellout show of Chicago where she played Mama Morton. So uh, go woke, break records on Chicago. The Black Broadcasting Company from James here, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, ma ma re really making the case. This guy is the least racist conservative. Here's the thing. Either Kevin knows full well that this is the audience that he's cultivating, or he gets somebody else to read the comments and keep him in complete ignorance. Either way, he knows full well the people that he's appealing to. People who honestly just want to see lgbtq plus people dead who just want to would, would take actions into their own hands if they were if they were able to kevin knows full well that that is the audience that he is catering to and either he believes that himself or he just does not care and he'll just or he'll just pander to the audience for uh for money basically and practically speaking there really is virtually no difference anyway i think yeah i don't think there's really too much more to say about this period drama uh it still likes to make period dramas it just can't do them anymore well, it just can't help itself, can it? <laughs> Are you going to write about this this week? You bet. I'm leading on it. Good. Excellent. Yes. And you <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah, I'm going to be leading on this story of drag and also on Great Expectations by the BBC. I had fucking nothing to say when talking to you about it, even though I'm basically playing to a receptive audience and to a host who just really couldn't really give a shit at this point. And even then, despite all of the open goals, despite all of the pins being set up for me to strike them down, I had nothing to say. I had no argument to put forward. Basically, we both just wanted the show to be over and then we can be embraced by the sweet embrace of our massive paychecks. But like I said, it's really, really strange to have someone like Ali Ross try and proclaim that he's trying to be saving and standing up for women and things like that at the BBC and uh, in society in general when Jeremy Clarkson wrote for The Sun saying that women should not be working at the BBC. Make it make sense, people. Make it make sense. So there we go. We've got a nearly eight-minute segment from Kevin O'Sullivan explaining why the BBC is obsessed with drag. Not only did they hardly have any examples of drag on the BBC, but the whole topic put it out after four minutes and they had to talk about something else how little ammunition they have how little controversy there is to actually be mined here how little issue they actually in the forefront of their mind actually take with this you need to understand they are lying and they know that they're lying once you understand that watching and deconstructing conservative reactionary arguments becomes significantly easier he caters to people who would go to a pride march and shoot up yeah even if kevin himself would not endorse those acts of violence even if he would um even if he would um, give condemnations and platitudes towards the victims or something he knows full well that that is the audience that he is catering for and he knows full well that this anti-drag anti-lgbtq plus hysteria that he is contributing to is directly leading to people's deaths is directly leading to acts of violence against the community he knows full well he just doesn't care either he doesn't care or he's actively supporting and rooting for their violence to be enacted against those communities and like i said practically speaking there is no difference there was a shooting at a gay nightclub uh, a few months ago and when that happened the conservative narrative shifted it was no longer you know thoughts and prayers thoughts and prayers it was they deserved it and that was a pretty horrifying shift to see unfold. And I think it's just a case of conservatives just now realizing they have no actual answers and no actual responses to what is going wrong in the world. So it's just deflect, deflect, deflect. That's why you're seeing this really violent rhetoric being applied to marginalized people. And Kevin, whether or not he wants to admit it, is playing a part in that. The Club Q shooting, yes, thank you, um, Mr. Thorfan64. Uh, yeah, it was the Club Q shooting where you saw the platitudes of thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. They didn't even happen that time around. It was just they deserved it, which was a horrifying shift. 